Hello, I'm Robert Ellsberg, the publisher of Orbis Books. I'm very happy to be joined here today by Catherine Keller, a very brilliant theologian who teaches at Drew University and is the author of many books, uh, but especially uh, her most recent book with Orbis Books, which is Facing Apocalypse, Climate, Democracy, and Other Last Chances. Uh, this book is about the book of Revelation, otherwise known as the Apocalypse, the last book in the Christian Bible. And I have to say, it's the first book that really helped me not only understand this very strange book, uh, but through it uh, as a kind of lens uh, to understand our contemporary world, especially in the light of the threat of catastrophic climate change. Now, it's not your first book uh, about the book of Revelation. What inspired you to take this up again? <laughs> right, I had hoped to leave the topic of the apocalypse back in the last millennium. <laughs> my, my book came out uh, in 96, the Apocalypse Now and Then book, and I, I really hoped the topic would glide into irrelevance and that I might have contributed <laughs> to, get, to being in a post-apocalyptic period. But um, yeah, I think, Robert, that what inspired me to take this topic up again is that I realized that we, we can't get rid of the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not fading out. And in this millennium, especially as this century unfolds, we're going to keep hearing lots and lots of smart and non-histrionic allusions to the apocalypse, to end things, to ultimate catastrophes. Uh, the, it's, it's just not going away. And if we can't lose the apocalypse, I, I figured we better use it. And uh, I didn't really mean to write a book on the book of Revelation, but you're right. That's actually the, the form that it took. But I thought of it more as writing with the book of Revelation using it as a lens through which I could see something about our situation now. You know, I, I just figured if, if the metaphor of apocalypse is going to keep coming up and it's going to come up in, in very responsible contexts, like references to the, the German study that the Guardian called the, the insect apocalypse. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, these, Im images are going to keep coming up. If they're going to keep coming up, I think it's a good idea to come to grips with the apocalypse itself, to have a, mm -hmm. have a better sense of what, what the word really means, what, what the concept, what the figure of apocalypse actually signifies uh, in its context in a way that has a, a kind of creepy reverberation mm -hmm with our context. Well, you, as you point out, I mean, many people associate the word apocalypse with the end times. In mm -hmm. fact, lots of fundamentalist Christians read the book of Revelation looking for all kinds of little hidden clues and uh, uh, that are supposed to be predictions of what's going to happen uh, any moment. Uh, but apocalypse has a different meaning as well, doesn't it? And, and the two of those together are, are significant. It has a very different meaning. And when I wrote about the apocalypse at the end of the last century, I was partly just interested in debunking that fundamentalist kind of use because it was having a lot of power mm -hmm. <laughs> through, the, through the religious right that had teamed up with the political right and had the great success of electing Ronald Reagan, et cetera. The, the book of Revelation was being effectively used for very uh, conservative, uh, indeed reactionary agendas. Uh, and yet those agendas always carried this expectation that the world is ending soon. It's, it's coming to the end. Uh, and the subtext then, which is clear in the kind of economic and ecological policies that the political right with the religious right espoused, that, that, that yeah. sense of the end meant uh, we might as well use up the world now. 
you know, if the world is coming to an end, then all of these attempts to uh, to enact sustainable poly policies to develop an economics that doesn't depend on on climate changing emissions, all the attempts to transform, reform, inhabit the world justly and wisely don't make much sense if it's coming to an end. You know, it's just about the salvation of my, my soul, maybe those I love so I can be with them, you know, in the end times and the heaven, when we get raptured up into heaven. Uh, so I was very concerned with the effects that that view was having on United States politics and culture. Uh, and with it, of course, a deep misogyny that's that is in the text. So I had I had dug pretty deep into the text. Though I'm not a biblical theologian, but I spent a lot of time uh, reading about the text and reading through it back then because I was so concerned with that uh, more fundamentalist sense that the end is coming. Uh, but the fact is that. Uh, there is no the end in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the whole Bible, <laughs> there mm -hmm. is not such a thing as the end of the world. Mm -hmm. There is great catastrophe anticipated and experienced and anticipated again through the whole prophetic tradition. And the book of Revelation anticipates terrible violence. Uh, at the level of human civilization and of its impact on the planet. So that's anticipated, uh, but mm -hmm. it's not the end of the world. Those catastrophes aren't the end of the book of Revelation or of the Bible. There is in fact a very earthly, a very literally down to earth regeneration. Uh, so mm -hmm. the whole notion that the apocalypse is the end is, uh, a dangerous overstatement, a dangerous misreading of, of the ancient text itself. Uh, and because the text is so powerful, it seems important to address that. Of course, the simplest way to address it is to remind people of what apocalypse itself actually means. Apocalypsis uh, means unveiling, mm -hmm. revealing. So it's about disclosure, not about the closure mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to explore that opening mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that the unveiling is actually about in its strange, uh, often uh, truly dark <laughs> metaphoric mm -hmm. language. Mm -hmm. uh, a language uh, that is carried in a kind of dreamlike mood of the visions, quite paranormal experiences involved in these visions, as well as, as the unfolding and development and citation of ancient prophetic Hebrew traditions. That's all coming together in that, in that language that's very, very hard to <laughs> translate into, into our kind of late modern prose, uh, but we can get that point, first of all, that it, it, isn't, it isn't a book about the end. Those are uh, literalizations and over readings that, that mm -hmm. came to control the use of the book, uh, really dangerous simplifications uh, that, that create, uh, <laughs> I think, disastrous effects. Mm -hmm. for our culture and for our culture's sense of commitment to creating mm -hmm. a future <laughs> that we want to live in for the rest of our lives and that we want the lives of, of the rest of us uh, who are going on, hopefully for mm -hmm. endless generations uh, to live. Mm -hmm. So it's, it mm -hmm. seemed to me now, because of what's happening, especially with climate change, that we've got to come to terms with the way this, this sort of myth of the end 
gets biblical sanction uh, and works around through our civilization, not just through the overt kind of climate denialism of the religious and political right, but it's also in the secular world in a kind of, in a kind of subliminal way. And I think it feeds then the, the nihilism mm -hmm. that can come up on the left, you know, like there's, there's no point, mm -hmm. uh, we're doomed anyway. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, between the denialism of the right and the, and the nihilism of a certain edge of, uh, that the left is, is tempted to, Mm -hmm. It seems important to then use the apocalypse as a kind of meditative device, not because John of Potmos predicted mm -hmm. our present moment. Mm -hmm. Prophecy is not prediction, mm -hmm. but because there is something in that very influential ancient narrative uh, that seems to still have tremendous resonance. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to, we mm -hmm. have to interpret it, therefore, mm -hmm. responsibly, mindfully, uh, and then it might be uh, an ally rather than a foe mm -hmm. in the struggle for a, a just and sustainable future. Well, John of Patmos was, was writing in the first century in the context of uh, Roman Empire. And as you say, not predicting things that were going to happen uh, 2,000 years uh, later, but unveiling uh, a kind of uh, uh, struggle between uh, different competing visions or, or spiritual impulses. And, and he shows how that's kind of played out against the screen of, of, of nature and history. Uh, so that there's this connection between human choices and behavior, uh, aspirations, uh, spiritual uh, distortions or whatever, misalignment that play out against, against the cosmos and against the world. Uh, and that's the fascinating kind of re reverberation with our, our own time in which you see uh, you know, climate change, not just as a scientific kind of problem or a problem of bad economics or something like that, but of uh, rooted in some very, uh, you know, <laughs> bad spiritual kind of uh, moral misalignment uh, that has political and economic implications, et cetera, and is now really being played out on the on the health of of, of the earth itself. And once you once you <laughs> kind of read through that lens, you can't help but seeing uh, the kind of uh, signs or 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 foreshadowings uh, in the book of Revelation of, of a kind of you know, climate catastrophe. Well, that's beautifully put. Um, yeah, there is, uh, there is a way in which, in which uh, <laughs> the ancient unveiling does anticipate uh, something that is becoming more and more clear to us now. There's, there's a way that uh, John of Potmos uh, and this very much in, in the tradition of, of Daniel, but also of Isaiah, of Jeremiah, uh, is recognizing that the kind of systemic human injustice that civilization mm -hmm. had gotten itself caught in uh, has, has terrestrial impact, a more than human impact. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think what hooked me in actually to, to getting back literally to the book of Revelation again after, after a couple of decades uh, was, was, was bumping in again to the text uh, sixth chapter where it's at, just after there's the opening of the seventh seal mm -hmm. and then there's a moment of, of of silence, actually, 30 minutes of silence are held in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very somber, uh, very kind of creepy moment uh, after the seventh seal is open. And, and what then comes forth that hooked me uh, into this project is this announcement that a third of the life of the sea 
oh, will die. A third of the oceans uh, will turn to blood. That is, they'll be poisoned. A third of the trees will burn. Mm -hmm. A third of the of the grass, the fields will burn up. So it's this this sense of of the earth and the sea somehow having then absorbed the toxicity mm. of the corrupt human civilization that struck me as, as uncanny, not in its prediction of what's happening now, but in its, in its exposure of a deep pattern mm. that we're still caught up in now. Mm. Mm. But as you say, uh, this, was, this was the Roman empire Mm -hmm. that John was criticizing. And that's partly why the book is so opaque, because he's talking about Rome and Caesar, but he doesn't use that direct language because he doesn't want <laughs> <laughs> the people he sends his letter to, the different sup supposedly seven communities who have his, get his letter and read it out loud. He doesn't want them all arrested, <laughs> tormented for dissidents against Rome. So, so it's coded. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what the 666, the Gematria code and all is a way of disguising uh, that this is talk about, about Caesar and about Rome. Uh, so it is about, uh, it is about this, this world civilization that had, that had conquered mm -hmm. the world that John knew. It, it had conquered mm -hmm. the world mm -hmm. from his perspective, mm -hmm. uh, from anyone's perspective who, who lived in his part of the world, uh, he was at, at this point in exile on an island off the coast mm -hmm. of what's now Turkey. Uh, so this sense of, 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 of a great world power having conquered the world uh, mm -hmm. in a radically oppressive controlling sense and with a voracious economic structure that's also made very explicit in the text in the misogynist mm -hmm. symbol of, of the great whore. That's the, the global economy of Rome that John's talking about. Mm -hmm. So he uses code and the beast the dragon represent mm -hmm. the, the Roman power. 666 is code mm -hmm. for, for Nero Caesar. So it, it's mm -hmm. about a civilization then mm -hmm. that was of immediate uh, <laughs> and constant concern uh, and that would, uh, would continue on its way as it had already begun during his lifetime in, in greater and greater persecution of followers of Jesus and greater and greater violence. So the fear, the, the dread expressed in the vision mm -hmm. isn't wrong. What does that have to do with us? <laughs> you know, we're way past the Roman Empire. Well, the point in my book is that uh, we're not we're not past it enough. <laughs> that we're still caught in in some of the same civilizational pattern. In some mm -hmm. important sense, we're part of the same civilization of that of that power hungry beast and of that <laughs> of that lascivious. Uh, global economy mm -hmm. uh, with horrific oppressive effects on its colonized populations, but also on the colonized earth. So that it's not that he was predicting the 20th or 21st century. Mm -hmm. It's that he was reading, I call it dream reading, a deep pattern of civilization mm -hmm. so deep that it, it might go on uh, for a terribly long time. And the, Roma, the Roman Empire did eventually collapse, uh, that world that uh, he was part of. But as you say, it was succeeded by other empires. Other uh, empires. Repeating the same kind of uh, patterns uh, over, over and over again, which means that his vision is very contemporary. Uh, and it, and it's, the text is pervaded by this, there's a, a, I don't know, just a deep sense of greed the death, the loss yes. of the world, of the species, and the the oceans, and 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 it fills you that you have a lot of you know references to 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 what, what's happening in the world today. You do feel a great deal of, of grief uh, reading that, but ultimately, uh, it's also 
a, a, a vision of possibility of, of, of a new world, of a new Jerusalem, of a new, of a new start somehow, uh, you know, if we are able to make that kind of conversion or leap. Uh, and so in that sense, it's not just a, a, a image for our time of hopelessness, but uh, all of it, there's gonna be a lot of bad things are gonna happen. Uh, but as you say, uh, in your, the subtitle, last chances, last chances are real chances. Uh, and so I presume you're, you're hoping that, that people will take away from this uh, reading, not just uh, despair, uh, but uh, some kind of vision of, of possibility or, 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 or another chance. Yeah, that's what it's about. Um, it's about a certain, no matter what, <laughs> mm -hmm. that things, uh, things can get very bad. They have over and over in history gotten very bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, there, there, there's been the genocidal annihilation of, for instance, 95% you know, of the indigenous populations of the two Americas. Worlds have ended. In that sense, worlds, many worlds have ended and more worlds are ending human and non-human with the great extinction spasm mm. that we're in. And yet it, it doesn't add up to the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And then the point of writing such a book, it, yeah, it's not to just warn, it's not to get out of my street corner <laughs> with the, my, my end is near placard. Mm -hmm. uh, at all, right? It's to say, uh, much, uh, much needless destruction has gone on through this civilizational history. Uh, more will go on, uh, but we do not have to remain trapped in this pattern. And it isn't just that it's all been evil, and now we hope for a transformation into the great, <laughs> virginally pure New Jerusalem, who will come down from heaven. Uh, that's not the, the helpful way of reading the text. No, there have been beautiful breakthroughs of, of justice. <laughs> I mean, even, even under the Roman Empire, I mean, with Constantine, you also had the, you know, he Christianized Rome, but of course that imperialized Christianity, but hospitals were built for the poor, et cetera. And later we do have breakthroughs of democracy. We do have the formal ending of slavery. We do have a very different life for women in, for, in my generation than was possible for my mother. We can point to endless examples of great breakthroughs mm -hmm. that have happened, uh, but that have also been in many ways uh, uh, disappointing, uh, betrayed. <laughs> so there's been a formal end to slavery, uh, but now we're listening <laughs> right now this week to the uh, to the trial, uh, uh, yeah. which is endlessly, endlessly reminding us uh, of the the 27 times George Floyd mm -hmm. repeated, "I can't breathe." Mm -hmm. So. There's the systemic racism that can take on this apocalyptic edge. But again, apocalyptic, not in the sense that it's all over, stop struggling. No, that something is becoming very clear. Mm -hmm. Something is being unveiled here and it's a chance for transformation. And that's true in relation uh, to white supremacism. Mm -hmm. It's true in relation to democracy with now, this horrific anti-democratic uh, law that's been passed in Georgia and that's mm -hmm. going to be <laughs> pushed through perhaps in multiple other states. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, democracy continues to be at risk, though we had a breakthrough in mm -hmm. this year's mm -hmm. election, uh, but mm -hmm. we see the anti-democratic forces uh, mobilizing in uh, really quite uh, horrific, barely precedented ways. Uh, and, and of course, it's, it's not new news mm -hmm. that we're gonna keep getting bad news on the climate front as we push beyond our, our deadlines to make big change. So mm -hmm. there's a lot to worry about, but all of this mm -hmm. bad news is actually disclosure mm -hmm. of a pattern uh, that we can change. 
it oh, this honesty open the honesty that this an apocalyptically tinted lens lends us mm -hmm. is to is to also glimpse the sparkle of possibilities yeah. for real transformation that doesn't mean that a good future is assured mm -hmm. that would again be a, a literalizing clunky reading of biblical prophecy mm -hmm. no these are powerful possibilities though glittering with the new jerusalem coming down all sparkly as a bride down to earth <laughs> and god comes down to earth the spirit comes down to earth mm -hmm. uh, it's the lamb is down to earth it's a down to earth mm -hmm. vision of sparkling possibilities for a just urban civilization with all the nations represented coming through the always open <laughs> gate so there are these are they're ancient metaphors of possibilities that keep on sparkling, but they are possibilities of our own, of our own time that have very little to do with John's time, uh, except in this, this deep and disturbing pattern that has continued to take different shapes of power and greed. Uh, in global form and that is mm. is haunting us very frighteningly now uh, and provoking stronger resistance stronger alternatives truly mm. promising mm. possibilities being discussed even at the white house mm. uh, for a green kind of <laughs> rebuilding of the economy, for instance. So yes, mm -hmm. the possibilities sparkle. The hope is there, but this is this is a hope that is mm -hmm. not optimism. No. It doesn't presume things are going to be fine. This is a this is a a shadowed hope. Well, thank you. We're we're running out of time here. Uh, but I, I can't help uh, remembering that as we're recording, this is actually Good Friday. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, the darkest you know, possible thing that could happen. Uh, and yet uh, not the last word, uh, at least in our, our, our tradition. And I think that, uh, you know, I think of that great poem that uh, Amanda Gorman uh, recited at the inauguration. And the yes. idea that, of, that there's always this promise there's possibility that's only possible if we first kind of envision it and you know john's revelation is a kind of envisioning of possibility uh that you know comes through terrible things are happening and so maybe that kind of hope or that possibility or that empowerment of our agency uh has to begin with first recognizing the terrible situation we're in but envisioning a different kind of possibility and I think your book uh, really uh, contributes to that uh, in a very powerful and beautiful way. So thank you very well, much. I know we're done, but let me read just this little poem that I use in my book because it's it's just so close to, to what you just communicated. This is from Bell Hooks, uh -huh. Latin elegy that it just seems seasonally right. Okay. Rock upon rock, charred earth in time, strong green growth will rise here, trees back to life, native flowers, pushing the fragrance of hope, the promise of resurrection. Amen, and may it be so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Thank you.